to um, share my screen um, with you. Okay, so um, I want to talk today about the workplace rights of survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. And so um, Legal Aid at Work is a nonprofit um, based in San Francisco, um, but we perform services and assist individuals throughout the state of California. Uh, we were founded over 100 years ago. Um, we use such tools such as litigation, clinics, helplines, policy advocacy work, and direct representation to assist workers in California. We have a variety of programs. Um, Project Survive is the program that I work under um, and what we'll be talking about today, but we have um, work and family, gender equity, LGBT rights, uh, wage protection, uh, racial economic justice and disability rights to name a few. Project Survive is uh, part of Legal Aid at Work and it's our a uh, program that helps survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking with issues that come up in the workplace. So we provide free legal representation, uh, perform community outreach, education, and policy, policy advocacy. We do have a dedicated survive helpline for survivors to call, um, to call us if they have any questions or concerns about issues in the workplace. Um, and I'll have all that information towards the end of the presentation. Why are survivor rights important in the workplace? Well, 60% of survivors either have to quit their jobs or are terminated because of abuse. And the Department of Labor has reported that survivors of domestic violence lose nearly 8 million days of paid work per year. So we know that work and economic stability are safety issues and they are very important to survivors to be able to leave dangerous situations So as we move forward in the presentation, I want us to focus on four of big topics that will come up in terms of workplace needs of survivors. So job protected time off. Do survivors have the ability to take time off of work and will their job be protected during that time? Second, workplace accommodations. So do survivors need specific workplace accommodations for safety reasons? And how can they ask for those? Is an employer required to provide those. Uh, protections against discrimination. So it's important that survivors feel that they can um, take this time off of work, ask for accommodations, and not be retaliated against, not be discriminated against because of their status as survivors. So we'll talk a little bit about what those protections look like as well. And um, fourth, which is very important in terms of economic stability, is income replacement. So survivors can they take the time off of work? Can they ask for accommodations? And during this time off of work, are they going to be able to receive income? What type of wage replacement policies and programs are in place so that survivors can safely take this time off of work and not lose income? So I wanna start off with job protected leave for survivors. And so um, as we talk about that, there are specific uh, leaves and specific laws that relate to survivors and they are codified in the labor code. So labor code section 230 is specific to survivors and it provides job protected leave for survivors to go to court. So um, I want to highlight a, a recent change in the law that I think is important for the public to know because it just came into effect uh, January of this year. And so labor code 230 before this year was um, specific for survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. But as of January 2021, it now includes survivors of a crime that has caused a physical mental, mental injury or a threat of physical injury. And so it has expanded and now protects more individuals. So I think that's important to keep in mind. So survivors are able to take job protected leave to obtain or attempt to obtain relief through the court system. And that can include a temporary restraining order, um, a permanent restraining order, or other injunctive relief to help ensure the health, safety, or welfare of the survivor or his or her child. And so that could look like um, potentially custody arrangements, um, anything that's gonna help protect the, 
the survivor and or their children. And um, before I move on, I just wanted to mention, I will um, address questions towards the end of every section, um, and then we can discuss if there's any questions that come up. And so um, moving on to a similar part of the labor code, labor code section 230.1. So this is also job protected leave for survivors, but this is to receive services. So two, section 230 was specific for issues with the court, getting restraining orders, temporary restraining orders, hearings, um, potential custody issues that have to do with going to court. And for that section, it applied to all employers, all employees. It didn't matter the size. It didn't matter how long you were working for the your employer, um, you were able to access that job protected leave. Now, for other job protected leave under section 230.1 to receive services, and we'll explain what services are in a second, um, your employer must have at least 25 or more employees. So this specific code section is going to be a protection that only survivors that work for larger companies, companies with 25 or more employees can access. And what this gives is job protective leave for survivors, again, of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and then the added uh, group, which would be any survivors of crime that caused a physical mental injury or a threat of physical injury. So these individuals can take job protected leave to attend doctor counseling visits, meet with a sexual assault uh, advocate, a DV advocate or a victim advocate um, to, to uh, do safety planning um, with organizations that can assist with that or to seek temporary or permanent relocation um, if they need to find shelter, um, they can take time off of work, job protected time off of work to be able to um, receive some of those services. And so um, disclosure requirements. So to get this time off of work, you do need to inform your employer um, that you are a survivor um, so that they know that they are required to give you this time off of work. Um, so you will need, if you do need leave, you do need to inform your employer that you your status as a survivor. Now, I know that can be um, a daunting thing to think about, to have to disclose such personal information, um, but it is important that they know this to be able to, to grant you that leave. And also know that an employer cannot retaliate against you for taking leave under section 230 or 230.1. So another uh, part of asking for a job protected leave under these sections, um, aside from having to disclose your status as a survivor is notice. So oftentimes notice to your employer that you need this leave is not possible, especially in very emergent chaotic situations it can be difficult. The last thing on your mind is to um, notify your employer that you need leave. So an emergency situation. So that's understandable and the labor code um, understands that. So if you can, reasonable notice should be given before taking time off if feasible. So if you know that you have a hearing in the future um, and you can give that notice, great. But oftentimes that's not possible. So unscheduled time off is still protected as long as the survivor can provide certification within a reasonable period of time. So what is it, what is certification? So certification, um, employers may request this and it can be any of the following. And there also has been changes. So now I will go over that as well. So certification can be a letter from a domestic violence or sexual assault counselor, a victim advocate or a healthcare provider, a police report documenting the violence, a court order such as a restraining order. Basically what the certification does is it explains that your status as a survivor, it explains why you needed you know, to take the time off um, during that what period of time it covers. And so that's why these are important. So if you have a court order, obviously saying you were in court during that time for a restraining order, then that will provide sufficient certification. Oftentimes you might not have this or many, survivors don't want to provide a police report because of some of the sensitive information that is in there and that's completely understandable. So 
there has been a recent change again um, in January of this year, and I think it's important to highlight that as well. This is a great change um, that I think will make things easier for survivors when it comes to certification. So as of January 1st of this year, a survivor needing to take time off of work under section 230 or 230.1 can use any other form of documentation, including a self-certifying written statement that verifies that a crime or abuse occurred and that the absence they took was for a legal purpose, for a purpose that you can use um, under Labor Code 230 or 230.1. And so what that means is basically a survivor can self-certify. They can write a letter themselves saying that they needed to take time off of work, that they are a survivor, they needed to take time off of work for whatever the reason would be, to go to court, to obtain a restraining order, to seek assistance from a local domestic violence uh, shelter, or organization that's helping them safety plan. Um, and that should be sufficient for the certification requirement. And so that that should ease a little bit of, of the requirements that survivors need to be able to take this time off work. Um, and so I wanna pause for a second and see if there are any questions um, on that section so far. Uh, yes, there's a question from Anna. Um, she want to know if you know uh, what you discuss as part of the um, uh, violence against uh, women act um it's actually uh, a california protection that's a great question anna um it's a california it's under california labor code and VAWA is actually a federal um federal legislation and so it's not specifically under VAWA. i think the um purpose is the same to protect survivors of domestic violence, survivors um, of uh, sexual assault, but it's not specifically under the federal program VAWA. Um, it is a, a California uh, protection under California law. Got it. Thank you. A question from Susan. What if your employer fired you, fire you because of a violent incident at your workplace? Okay, that is uh, a great question as well. So, um, if you have been, it sounds potentially like it could be retaliation, um, a termination because you, uh, you know, were potentially attacked um, in the workplace. So we just with that little bit of information, I would say that there's potential um, for a violation. And so um, I would suggest contacting an attorney. You can contact our office. Um, we could potentially. Uh, Get better more information and try and evaluate the situation to see if there were um, any potential violations of your workplace rights but um, generally speaking uh, an employer should not take any retaliatory measures um, including terminating someone um, just because they are a survivor and but we would need a little bit more information about that thank you another question from anna would this definition under the labor code include a legal internship? Um, so as long as there is um, an employer employee relationship. And so um, even if you might not be getting paid or if you are getting paid, um, there is gonna be some sort of relationship between um, the person that's directing your work and you as the employee or worker, then you should be um, covered under protection under this protection. So yes. Thank you. And that's all the question we have so far. Great. Okay. So um, if anything else comes up, um, again, we'll we'll check back in towards the end of the section. So um, moving on, protections against discrimination for survivors. So um, the labor code also has this protection and it's codified um, in law. And so an employer may not discriminate based on an employee's known status as a victim, which is the language used in the labor code, but as a survivor of domestic violence, sexual assault or stalking. And so that's important to note um, that there are protections for survivors that they cannot be discriminated against because of their status. And so um, we'll talk about what what type of what discrimination could look like um, on the next slide. So what are some examples? Because oftentimes it might be difficult to know um, whether or not someone's actions or what they're saying um, could be considered discrimination. Um, oftentimes we feel it and we feel like something's wrong, but um, what really could be considered discrimination under, under the slaver code? So 
I'm going to go through a couple of examples I think will be helpful in understanding that. So Anne advises her survivor, her supervisor, that she is in the process of getting her name changed as part of a safety plan to protect her from her ex-husband. Her employer's response is to tell her that she has a liability and fires her. So that is going to be prohibited discrimination. Um, Anne is disclosing her status as a survivor. She's disclosing um, that she you know, is taking measures to protect herself from her ex-husband from future violence. And her employer's response is to fire her. So that is going to be prohibited discrimination. So um, Maria tells her employer that she fears her ex-boyfriend and has a restraining order against him. Her employer tells her that it does not want to become involved in her personal problems and fires her. So this again is gonna be prohibited discrimination. Um, Maria telling her employer that she has a restraining order against her ex-boyfriend is something that we often see survivors do is to inform their, their employers. That way they're on notice, that way they know oftentimes they'll give them a copy of the restraining order because the restraining order will say that the person can't come within a certain you know distance from their home um, and work workplace. And so it's important oftentimes for survivors to give that information to their employer. That way they're on alert. That way they know that this person's not allowed to be around here. Um, and so this is a very inappropriate response from an employer um, and is prohibited discrimination. Um, the last example, Lara advises her employer that her stalker has been calling her multiple times each day on her work line. Her boss terminates her for taking too many personal calls. So let's look at the third one. The third one I think is interesting because um, it doesn't necessarily go it's not as you know direct as your liability, your personal problems. This is you know you're just taking too many personal calls, but it is still considered. It still is um, discrimination because Laura is telling them that this person is not someone she wants to get calls from. She's she these calls are not welcomed. Um, this person is a stalker, and so this is not the appropriate way for the boss to handle this and um, it is prohibited discrimination. And I actually wanna go back and, and talk about that for a second. Um, you know, what would have been a, a, a better response to that? What could Laura's employer have done? And I think one example would be to have um, basically said, you know, let's change your work line or let's not have your work line listed on our website. So there's ways that employers can work with employees to um, you know, not only not commit discrimination, but also provide a, a safe work environment for um, employees that might be survivors. And I think, um, and we're gonna get into a little bit more about that under accommodations. Um, but that was just a little bit of preview of what um, an employer can do. So I think we might have a question. Um, it's Anna. She's actually uh, saying that oh, um, the the, um, the person could let the calls go into voicemail. It, would you you know recommend if, if your client you know it's getting calls from stalkers? Would you recommend them to just you know? let the calls go to voicemail? Yeah, so um, that is a great question. Um, obviously the, the uh, survivor could just let the calls go to voicemail, um, but it could be difficult as well. It could be so many calls that other calls can't come in. Um, it could be a distraction. Um, maybe the person really needs, she has a job where they really need to use their phone. And so having that person um, basically take over that line is going to um, create problems. And so, we can talk a little bit more about what accommodations can look like, um, but uh, you know there there are solutions um, for a situation like that. And I think one solution would be to change the person's work line, change the person's work line, block that person's number. We've had case instances where um, an employer has blocked a specific number if they know the number of the stalker um, or the person that that's harassing the worker. Um, or just unlist uh, 
that number if it's like public if the person's extension is is public um, on the website company website um, so there are definitely some solutions um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that um, in this section so workplace accommodations so um, employers actually do have the responsibility um, to work with the workers who are survivors when it comes to their safety and safety accommodation. So an employer must grant a survivor's request for a reasonable safety related change on the job, unless doing so could, would cause an undue hardship. Um, and this is codified in the labor code. So there's protection exists in California under section 230 um, F. So what does this mean? So um, the change, the accommodation has to be safety related. It has to be individualized. So based on the survivor's particular needs. And um, once the survivor requ requests a change, um, the employer is required to participate in what we call the interactive process. What that means is they need to communicate openly and consistently with the survivor to try and determine what is um, an effective accommodation. And so, um, you know, the third part, the last fourth part is you cannot cause an undue hardship to the business. So when it comes to the interactive process, what's important is it's a back and forth. So the survivor is going to ask for accommodation. Let's say um, they ask that they be removed from the company website um, as a safety related change. Um, they don't want to be listed um, as an employee um, on the website. And so, you know, the employer could just say, great, we can do that. And that, that would be the end of the interactive process. But what if the employer says, no, you know, we, I don't think we can do that. Um, but we can maybe take your picture down. Um, so they're, they're engaging in the interactive process um, to see like they're saying, well, we can't provide you this, but maybe we can do this. Or if someone requests being moved um, to a different location for safety reasons. Um, maybe they, you know, they say we can't do that, but we can put you in an area of this office that is not accessible to the public. So um, it's the interactive process of back and forth. The employer can't just be like, no, and leave it at no. They need to say why they can't or offer some sort of alternative. Um, now, there is the possibility that the employer can say they can't because it's an undue hardship on them. And so, um, you know, that is something that they have to show that it really is an undue hardship. And, you know, they would say potentially that it's too expensive for them. It's not something they could do, you know, realistically accomplish. Um, but oftentimes that's, you know, not the case. And oftentimes some of these requests are, are really not that difficult. Um, you know, changing someone's number or blocking a number, um, taking someone's information down from from the website. So um, it's it's not often that we see that undue hardship. And you know here are some examples I talked about earlier. I mentioned already mentioned changing someone's work telephone extension, removing contact information from a website, relocating someone's workstation, modifying their schedule. Maybe it's better for them to come in in the middle of the day instead of early. Um, different days, reassigning a different shift, uh, allowing a transfer to a different location, installing locks or surveillance cameras, or any other equipment that would potentially enhance the security of the workplace. And um, disclosure. So again, it will be necessary that the employee inform their employer that they are a survivor to be able to request this safety accommodation. Um, they need to know why they're requesting it um, and the fact that they are a survivor. Again, an employer cannot retaliate against a survivor for requesting a reasonable safety related accommodation and cannot discriminate against an employee um, because of their status as a survivor. Um, and so enforcement, so how, what, what would we, you know, where can a survivor go if, um, someone is violating any of the sections or protections under labor code 230 to 230.1, including safety related accommodations. Well, they would file, um, they could file a complaint with the California Division of Labor Standards Enforcement, um, the retaliation unit, which is the DLSC, um, known as the Labor Commissioner's Office. Um, and so um, you would have one year from, um, 
the retaliatory act or one year to, to be able to file a complaint um, with the labor commissioner or the DLSE. Okay, and so I think we might have some questions on that before I move on to income replacement. Uh, no, there's no question, but oh, um, Anna just just wrote, is this retroactive? Um, is this retroactive? So um, it you can go back a year. So what that means is um, if this happened to you, um, you know, eight months ago, nine months ago, um, you can still file a complaint, but there is a one year statute of limitations to um, be able to bring this claim to the, the DLSC Labor Commissioner's office. Thank you. There's no other question for now. Okay, great. So um, now let's talk about income replacement. So these protections are great, and especially the job protected leave, but in reality, um, you know, some individuals are not gonna be able to access this leave if they don't have um, income during this time. So they can have the leave, but if they cannot get income replacement during the time that they're taking this leave, um, it really becomes inaccessible to them. So it's important to talk about what programs exist so that survivors can take um, job protected leave. So um, there is uh, some programs for the EDD, the California State Disability Insurance. And so this is a partial wage replacement uh, program that is available to workers who are unable to work due to non-workplace disabilities or injuries. Um, this actually includes pregnancy as well. Um, and it will replace 60% of uh, wages for all workers and 70% for the lowest income earners. Uh, citizenship and immigration status are irrelevant, uh, but there is a one week waiting period uh, when you do apply. So how could a survivor use this? So if a survivor finds himself injured or disabled and um, disabilities aren't just physical, they can be um, mental disabilities, they can request um, state disability insurance if they're if they're able to get a, a medical certification from their doctors. And so um, survivors can potentially use this to, if they need to take time off of work to recover um, from any disabilities or injuries, they can use this to, to replace their wages. Um, also paid family leave. So this is something that we see used by um, caregivers of survivors, family members. Um, and so what this is, is a partial, again, partial wage replacement program. Um, it can be used for a variety of things. Um, you know, in the context of survivors, we have seen it used um, when their family members have needed to, to take time off to care for them. So you can use it to care for a seriously ill close family member, which would include a child, parent, spouse, domestic partner, sibling, parent-in-law, grandchild, grandparent. Um, so, you can use it to care for a seriously Ill close family member and it's gonna replace your wages again in the same uh, percentage, 60% for most workers, 70% for lowest income earners. Um, you can use it for other uh, instances as well, um, potentially outside of the, the context of survivors, but people use it for bonding with a newborn child um, or for leave arising out of uh, military deployment. Um, but we have seen it used um, when there is a survivor who needs uh, to be cared for by another close family member, that family member can tap into paid family leave. And what it provides is up to eight weeks of wage replacement per year. Um, same thing as SDI, citizenship and immigration status um, do not affect eligibility. This can be taken intermittently or all at once. So it doesn't have to be taken um, altogether. And so um, when it comes to for example, bonding will bear to take it at the same time and must be taken within a year, but um, it is something we've seen caregivers of survivors take um, to be able to, to take time off of work to care for a survivor that might need their assistance. And how do you apply? So to apply for SDI and PFL, um, you apply through the EDD, the Employment Development Department, you can apply online or through a paper application. Um, and just to reiterate again, citizenship and or immigration status um, are not an eligibility requirement. 
And um, another way that a survivor can be paid, get wage replacement while they take time off of work is through, um, I'm sure many of you have heard of California's paid sick days. Well, they're actually paid safe days as well. And what that means is um, the same paid sick days that you use when you're sick um, to care for a family member that is sick uh, can also be used for survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault and stalking. And so um, they're called paid safe days at that point. And so you, in California, you accrue one hour for every 30 hours worked. Um, basically all employers have to give up to three days a year. In San Francisco, um, there's San Francisco specific ordinances that provide for more. So in San Francisco, if you have 10 or more employees, you get up to 72 hours. Um, if you have less than 10, you get up to 40 hours. So there's, there's uh, more hours that you can use in San Francisco for your paid safe days. And this is something that survivors can use when they need to take job or time off, to go to court, to seek services. Um, they can use this time. Okay, and so um, I want to check in and see if we have any questions. Yes, uh, there are two questions. Uh, one from Anna. Is there retroactive enforcement under federal law? If so, what would the statute of limitation be? Um, unfortunately, I am unfamiliar with if there is a retroactive enforcement under federal law because these are California specific protections. Um, so I, I would unfortunately not be able to answer that um, for you. And okay. so I apologize about that, but, um, if you do have really specific questions, I would urge you to call us, um, on the, our helpline and see if we can maybe provide you with more information and, and look into those issues a little bit more. And I'll, towards the end of the presentation, have a slide that has, um, our contact information. Okay. Uh, I, I think that, uh, she, uh, clarified, she said her internship, um, here, I think in, you know, in the Bay Area was a federal program. Does it matter? Oh, okay. No, that that wouldn't um, that wouldn't matter. All uh, employees that work in California um, are covered under this law. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, another question from uh, Eve: What if injury or assault happens at work? Can you get state disability? Or if it doesn't happen at work, uh, but the perpetrator is a coworker? That's a great question. So um, if an injury happens at work, you actually can apply for um, workers compensation. So any injury that happens at work, um, you would uh, apply for the workers compensation through the workers compensation program. Um, every employer in California has to have workers compensation insurance. And so any injury that happens at the workplace um, while you're at work would be covered under that. Um, and so that would that's what you would use as workers' compensation. And so they would, um, you know, provide medical attention for the injuries, and then also potentially provide for temporary disability benefits while you recover from those injuries. And that's through workers' compensation. And um, and then I think you said there was a second part to that. No, that 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 was it. I, but the. Uh... She asked actually about stay disability. Um, yeah, so the state disability insurance program SDI, which I spoke about in a few sites before, that's for work, that's for injuries that happen outside of the workplace. Um, so if you're, for example, in a car accident, or if you are the survivor of um, an attack outside of the workplace, and you would use SDI if you're uh, disabled and needing time to recover. Um, if you suffer an attack or an assault at the workplace, then workers' compensation would be what, the program that you would use to get medical attention as well as receive temporary disability benefits. Um, I think the second part of the question was if, if it doesn't happen at the work site, but the individual who the attacker is a coworker, so if something happens outside of the workplace, not on during workplace hours, not when you're supposed to be working, not during a shift and not on the work site, uh, but the person is someone you work with, a coworker, um, then you would use um, SDI. It wouldn't be workers' compensation um, because it's not at the work site, even though the person's a coworker. So um, 
it wouldn't be considered workers a workers' comp issue. And I think, um, I think those are all the questions. So I'm going to move on to unemployment insurance for survivors. Um, so this is something that I think is not as well known. Um, so I want to go over it. So if a survivor, um, we talked about, you know, staying at work, getting time off of work, workplace safety related workplace accommodations. Um, but what if a survivor cannot stay at work? What if they have to leave? Um, in California, um, you know, we've seen a lot of information about unemployment insurance recently, recently especially during the pandemic. Um, and so there is a provision in California for survivors of domestic violence um, where they can establish good cause. So most of the time to get unemployment insurance, you need to have been laid off or basically let go from your job through no fault of your own. Um, you can't quit and receive unemployment insurance usually. Um, but in California, if you can establish good cause for leaving, um, then you could potentially still get unemployment insurance. Um, and so if you need to leave your job because you need to protect yourself or your children from domestic violence, um, then you could likely establish good cause, um, which would allow you to still get unemployment insurance, even though you were the one who left your your job. And so to establish good cause, a survivor must show that their that themselves or their children experience an act or threat of domestic violence abuse, um, that the survivor has a restraining order, a police report, or really any other information that would identify the batterer and or verifies the abuse. Um, and then a leave of absence or a transfer was not available or would not resolve the problem. And so we have seen this happen before. I, ha I had a client who um, was being stalked by their abusive ex-husband at their place of work and um, had requested, had a restraining order, um, had requested a leave uh, or transfer, I'm sorry, um, because this individual kept on showing up to her workplace and they were unable to grant the transfer. Um, they gave a leave of absence, but then they needed the person back. Um, and so it was just not safe for her to go back. And so she had to quit that job um, because it was just unsafe for her. And so she was able to show good cause and able to still qualify for unemployment insurance, even though she was the one who essentially quit. Um, and so this is the next section. So I wanted to see if anyone had any questions regarding that before I moved on. Uh, not yet. I don't see any question now in the chat. Okay, thank you. So um, for the next part, um, I wanna talk about some other just protections available to survivors. And so um, we spoke a little bit about that, um, which is job protected leave to care for uh, your own serious health condition or that of a family member. We talked a little bit about that when we talked about paid family leave, um, but that was for wage, that was a type of wage replacement, a type of income replacement. Um, we didn't really dive yet into job protected leave. And again, I wanna just emphasize that in California, when you take job protected leave, um, you also have to see, am I gonna get paid? And sometimes there are different processes and different laws, one that protects you while you take the time off and one that gives you income replacement while you're taking that time off. Um, the only difference is for paid sick days and paid safe days, um, this, the law protects both. Your job protects your job while you're taking the time off and gives you income replacement. But aside from those um, in California, you, have, you really have to analyze, can I take this time off of work? for example, under labor code section 230. Um, and then can I get paid for taking this time off um, of work? And so that's where the wage replacement programs come in, like paid family leave or state disability insurance. Um, and then the second issue I wanna talk about is reasonable accommodations for disabilities, which is something I think gets um, overlooked sometimes in these instances. So um, this is um, something I really wanna highlight because it, there is a big change in the law as well. So the Calif California Family Rights Act, um, CIFRA, it's 
oftentimes uh, I would say confused with FMLA, um, but which is the federal program that is similar. Um, but this is a really big distinction. So California Family Rights Act, CIFRA, provides 12 weeks of job protected leave for various reasons. Um, one is to bond with a new child. Uh, the, other, the others are to care for a family member. So we spoke about getting wage replacement for that. Now this allows you to actually take the time off work and have your job be protected while you do that. So to care for a family member. Now, there has been some changes beginning January 1st, and I want to highlight those because they're really big changes. So um, before January 1st, you could take time off of work to care for a family member, which included a parent, spouse, domestic partner, child, but it has been expanded since January to include grandparent, grandchild, or sibling with a serious health condition. And so this aligns better now with paid family leave. Um, the same, some of the same family members included in paid family leave are now included in the California Family Rights Act, which will allow individuals to, through paid family leave, get paid while they take time off and through CIFRA, California Family Rights Act, actually have job protected time off. So they have a job protected and they get wage replacement while they're taking this time off. Um, so to bond, to care for a family member, for your own serious health condition, um, or because of, uh, um, some issue with military active duty deployment. And so um, there have been changes in the eligibility, great changes, we think, that have included more uh, workers in California. So you need to have been at your job for a year to be able to take CIFRA leave. Um, you need to have worked at least 1,250 hours in the prior year before you take the leave, which is about half time. Um, and here's the big change. You only have to work for an employer that has five or more employees. So before this, and um, basically it mirrored the federal law FMLA, you needed to have 50 uh, or more employees. Uh, and so it really only covered larger employers and people who worked for larger businesses. But now you can still take CIFRA leave if you work for a smaller uh, employer, smaller company, you only need to work for somewhere that has five or more employees. And so that has really expanded who can take CIFRA leave. Um, and so I think that's a great, a great change. Um, there, you know, there are some advocacy work and we are working in our office, um, trying to push policy so that, you know, who a family member is, who you can take time off for, gets expanded to chosen family. And we think that's really important, particularly in the survivor um, context, because, you know, what, who is someone's support system? Who can they rely on? Sometimes it is unfortunately someone in their family that is maybe perpetuating the abuse. And so um, who is this person's chosen family? Who is the person that would be taking care of them? Sometimes it's not anyone on that list. And so as an organization, um, advocates around the state are trying to push policy changes um, in the California legislature to be able to expand the definition of a family member to be able to have someone have a chosen family, chosen family member. Maybe someone that's not related by blood or um, necessarily by law. And so that would be, we think, a great um, expansion to protections and rights for survivors. If you are interested in, in, in any advocacy in that or in being a part of that, um, you can always contact our office. Um, if you've been affected by that, uh, we would love to hear from you as well. So um, we talked about, you know, other leave, which is CIFRA. Um, now I want to talk about other protections, disability protections. So under the ADA, which is the American with Disabilities Act um, and FEHA, which is the Fair Employment and Housing Act, which is our California equivalent, uh, the ADA is a federal law. Um, this prohibits discrimination against employees with mental or physical disabilities. Um, and disabilities under the ADA are just any impairment that will substantially limit, and under FEHA actually it's a little bit reduced, just has to limit a major life activity, which would include working, you know, walking, sleeping, eating, anything like that. And so these protections can be used by survivors as well who might have impairments or disabilities, who might suffer from PTSD, anxiety, depression. Um, you know, if they require reasonable accommodations, we spoke about 
safety related accommodations, but sometimes survivors need other types of accommodations because of um, you know, potential disabilities or impairments that they have. And so if they do need an, a reasonable accommodation um, at work that would allow them to, to enable them actually to work with this, um, these disabilities that might limit some of the things that they do, they can request accommodations. And so some type, some examples of reasonable accommodations include leaves of absences, reduced work schedules, transferring um, structural modifications to how they're being managed, so management styles. Um, to be able to request these, you would need, unlike the, you know, it's a little similar to safety related accommodation, you would need a medical certification. Um, and employers can uh, potentially say that they can't provide this combination if they have, and if it would be an undue hardship. Um, but this is just something to keep in mind for survivors that might need it. Um, leave is also a disability accommodation. So if, for example, you have used uh, your 12 weeks of job protected unpaid leave under CIFRA, um, and you still need leave from work, um, you can use, uh, you request a, a disability accommodation and request it as leave. So if you don't, for example, if you don't qualify or have already exhausted your FMLA or CIFRA leave, you may be able to take leave as a reasonable accommodation. Um, again, unless it's an undue hardship, which um, in which case the employer, employer would have to look for an equivalent vacancy, but um, you can request leave as a disability accommodation. Uh, but it would be important to give your employer a return to work date. So, um, you know, you always want to say that you are planning to return to work on a certain date, even if that might change in the future. But even if it's tentative or later extended, um, you need to make sure that your employer knows that your intention is to come back. You obviously just need time to recover or to, you know, as part of an accommodation for disability. And um, another, um, I think sometimes unknown uh, protection and right that we have is specifically in San Francisco is a San Francisco family friendly workplace ordinance. And so workers have the right to request flexible or predictable work arrangements to assist with care for minor children, seriously ill family members, a parent over 65. Um, now employers can deny the request um, if they have a bona fide business reason, um, but they have to explain that in writing. Um, the requirement would be that you have 20 or more employees to be able to, to, to take advantage of this ordinance, um, have worked six months on the job, and work at least eight hours per week. And so having a flexible and predictable work arrangement um, is something that um, survivors oftentimes need. Um, it helps with safety planning as well. And um, actually that is the end of uh, the substantive part of the presentation. I'm happy, I'm sure we might have some questions, but I just wanted to briefly um, touch base on some of our materials. So we have um, something called uh, Domestic Violence and My Job. And so it's a great uh, fact sheet that really breaks down these laws that we went through, the protections, if you need time off work, you need, um, is, is it job protected? If you need wage replacement, um, reasonable accommodations and protections. And it really breaks down, like if you're the person going through, um, you know, violence, or if you're a survivor, what protections do you have? What laws protect you? Um, what options do you have? And then on the other side, it'll say, you know, I'm a caregiver, I'm someone who, um, is caring for someone who is a survivor, what protections, what options do you have to be able to do that effectively and still maintain your job, get wage replacement. And so we have this in multiple languages on our website um, available um, just you know, to provide more information to the public. And um, we also have a survivor's toolkit. So this is something where we're actively working on updating it, um, but there's some great material right now in it. Uh, online and you'll have sample request letters. So if you need a reasonable safety related accommodation, there's a sample request letter in there. Um, sample request letters for time off of work, to go to court or to seek services, and then sample healthcare provider or victim advocate certification. So, um, you know, if you are working with a victim advocate or um, a, a DV advocate and they would like to help you with certification and you wanna provide them with a, a sample letter of 
um, that would be appropriate, then that's in the toolkit as well. Um, and then if you have, again, any additional questions, um, more resources, our website um, is here. Um, we have a work and family helpline. They can help with more questions about like stiff relief or, you know, you saw some instances where we talked about someone being pregnant or caregiving. Um, the work and family program helps quite a bit with issues like that. Um, and I do think there's gonna be a presentation given by one of my colleagues in the future um, about that for the San Francisco Public Library. And then Project Survive Helpline is um, specifically geared for survivors who have workplace questions. Um, and then Workers' Rights Clinic, if you have any other question relating to work, um, any issues that you wanna discuss with someone, um, you can uh, make an appointment with our Workers' Rights Clinic, which is now being held virtually, um, so they can assist you and multiple fact sheets in various languages on our website as well. Um, and so I wanna see if there's any uh, additional questions um, from the last section or just from anything else that we Yes, uh, we have two questions, one from Eve. Um, she wrote, does sexual harassment count as a good cause to leave a job to get an employment? It definitely can, it can be, yes. So um, there are, there's a little bit more to it, but um, if uh, you are experiencing severe sexual harassment in the workplace, it can potentially be used as good cause um, for having had to have quit instead of being, you know, oftentimes we say, we know that unemployment is for people who are laid off, but if you need to quit um, for your own safety because of, you know, sexual harassment issue in the workplace, then it could be. Um, and so we would need more information and, and we could definitely discuss that in greater detail. Um, but there are some provisions that could potentially protect someone who had to quit because of sexual harassment at work. Thank you. Uh, a question from Anna. Uh, what is an undue hardship exception accommodation under FEHA or ADA? What might this look like? Okay, okay. So an undue hardship exception would be if an employer, um, an it would be an exception to providing that reasonable accommodation under the ADA or FEHA. And so an undue hardship would be, um, you know, it's too expensive for, for the employer. It's an undue hardship on them. They couldn't provide this accommodation you're requesting because it's too expensive. It would slow productivity down to the point where they would not be, you know, performing work substantially. Um, and so that would definitely be um, something they could say would be an undue hardship. So it would make it so that like their business couldn't run financially, logistically. Um, oftentimes it really does hinge on finance. Like they can't afford to um, provide this accommodation because it would be prohibitively too expensive. Um, again, this is a case-by-case -case basis, and obviously for every employer, it's going to be different. Someone like Walmart, someone, you know, a huge corporation is going to have a hard time saying um, that a small accommodation is going to be an undue hardship, whereas potentially a smaller employer, um, a mom and pop shop could say something could be too expensive or, or something they logistically couldn't do and could say it's an undue hardship, but it's case-by-case. Thank you, Maria. Um, I don't see any other question in the chat. Um, does anybody else have a question? You can put it in chat. There's a lot of thank you <laughs> for you, Maria. Wonderful presentation. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't see other questions. But thank you so much, uh, Maria. We really appreciate you taking the time to share with us um, your professional expertise. Um, and thank you, everyone, um, for joining the program. I hope you find the presentation informa information um, informative and helpful to you. Oh, uh, what, one question from Eve. Uh, is the clinic free? Yes, Maria. all of our services are free of charge. Every, okay. every Any assistance we provide. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. So um, uh, we will be sending out an evaluation survey together with the slide deck and a link to the recording later today. Um, please give us your feedback so we can continue to improve. Again, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.